thank you all for for really opening the doors to me and hosting me. I've had a, a most wonderful day. I arrived very early in the morning and I'm leaving soon. But it has been a, a constant dialogue with terrific minds, really very bright, uh, lucid, provocative questions that have come to me from uh, all sorts of people throughout the day in Spanish and in English and in other languages. And I am most impressed. You have a terrific uh, institution here. Um, I am sure you're proud to be here, and I'm sure you are aware also of the responsibility that it comes that comes from being in such an institution and from letting the knowledge that takes place here uh, broaden and uh, get out into the community so that others can also benefit from it. I have to tell you that even though this is really my very first time, not in, in, in Chicago and certainly not in Illinois, but in your wonderful uh, school, it is not the first time I have been here, at least in spirit. About uh, 10 years ago, uh, Maestro Jose Palo started a, what I think was already a tradition. And that is that for me, sometime in the spring, I believe, um, I get generally a wonderful envelope of many, many letters from students in the various Spanish courses that he teaches who tell me what they think about uh, Spanglish, the future of this most uh, bizarre and uh, 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 provocative uh, linguistic phenomenon, and they do so in such a warm and personal way. Uh, I get them all, I read them very carefully, and then I think if I sat down and answered each and every one, I would not be able to write another book. And uh, yet I have the guilt, and at the same time the desire to come and see you, and here I am. So it feels enormously uh, exciting for me to finally meet Cara Akara, and I want to thank Professor uh, Jose Palos for uh, breaching out and connecting with me on the other side of the divide. I would like to spend the next 30 minutes or so uh, trying to, to do what you have done to me throughout the day, provoke you. Um, I am not, if I, if I succeed, you are not going to be entirely in agreement with everything that I've said. I want you to have your own opinion, a very different opinion. I want to give you the, a series of facts, a series of questions, and then with those questions and with those facts, I want you to develop your own mind as to what this phenomenon of Spanglish is. I want to begin by uh, posing large questions and then zooming in slowly uh, in order to analyze Spanglish in and of itself. And the large questions have to do with with, with language, really, in general. Where does language come from? Um, who is in charge of language? To what extent do we own the language that we speak? Uh, if not, who owns that language? Are we simply the facilitators of the words that have come to us? Or are we enablers? Are we active in the creation of words? How many words do each of us speak every day? What is the data bank? of words that we have at our disposal. What is the average American's uh, language? Uh, how, many, how many sentences are there that he or she shapes during an average day? And of course, the big question here could be, who is this average American? Is it a, an upper class, a middle class, a lower class? Does he live in the West Coast or she lives in the East Coast? Is he young or old? So all these questions, I'm sure, are already beginning to form in your mind and they are not easy to answer, but that is my, my point. And then I also want to ask you if you have any sense of how many words are there in the English language? How many words do we use today and how many we've inherited from our predecessors? You know, the beauty of a language is that we share it not only with our contemporaries, we will also share it with people that will come after us and we share it with those that came before us. When you say the word moon, the word moon has been already a elevated in beautiful poems by Shakespeare or by Milton or by Keats. And we are simply the, the, the depositories of those words, but not, not only the depositories. We can turn those words into poems. We can turn those words into sentences. How many words do we have that have already come from the past? And how many words are we able to create anew 
out of, out of nothing words that are going to be ours and are going to be pushed to the next generation. I want to ask you also if you have any idea what is the difference between the amount of words that the English language has in other languages, say uh, Spanish. Does English have more words than Spanish? Does English have more words than French? Does English have more words than Mandarin or Cantonese or Arabic or Hebrew? How many words did Shakespeare have at his disposal when he wrote Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet or The Tempest? How many words? His contemporary, they died almost on the same day, did Cervantes have to write Don Quixote? Did he have more? Did he have less? And is the amount of words that Cervantes has at his disposal in 1605 when he publishes the first part of Don Quixote or in 1615 when he publishes the second part different in size than the amount of words that Borges had when he published Ficciones in 1949 or Garcia Marquez in 1967 when he published A Hundred Years of Solitude. Now, it would be easy to think that a writer of the 20th century, of the second part of the 20th century, would have more words than a writer from the 17th century. Well, perhaps, but are we able to remember more words, or do we simply have more words at our disposal, but our memory is limited, for we can't remember every word that is out there. We can only remember a certain number of words, and the, and the act and dialectical coming and going between remembering and forgetting is a crucial element in the shaping not only of every speaker, but of every writer. Putting all that together, and we can go deeper in the section of questions and answers if you really want to see what's the difference, for instance, of the amount of words that the OED has. But in the foreword, it says how many words it has when compared to the Diccionario de la Real Academia Española, which also states how many words it has. It, we're going to go deeper there, but I want to give you a, a little I'm going to give a little twist here to bring to you the topic that I have been so concerned, maybe you could say obsessed, with in the last 10 or 15 years, and that is Spanglish. Spanglish is not a language, but it is a language. It is a form of communication that uh, results from the marriage or perhaps the divorce of two languages, English and Spanish, or perhaps it is something even more complex than that. It is the encounter and the separation of two civilizations, not languages alone, but civilizations, meaning the Anglo and the Hispanic one that come together or not in this particular moment in the United States today. Spanglish often is looked down at as unworthy, as being spoken by the illiterate, those that don't have access to education, women in the kitchen, or men that are delivering pizza, or children who have not been able to go to a high school, or people who simply are um, picking the lettuce or the oranges on the street, meaning people that we, the snobs, consider to be not as prepared as we are. And for that reason, Spanish is often presented as a broken language. But I want you to think for a second, what does it mean to speak a broken language? And I'm using this term broken because Amy Tan, the Chinese American writer, refers to it when her mother, who was an immigrant from China, could not really make a sentence when answering the phone and the person on the other side would be speaking in English and Amy would have to jump in and become the translator. Amy would tell her mother, don't worry, you're fine. And the mother would say, I am speaking a broken Chinese. What does it mean to speak a broken language? Which language is broken? When did it break? How does a language break? And if a language is broken, what language is not broken? What language is fully formed? I think that you are probably beginning to get a sense of the class and education distinction that we have through our different languages. Those that are fully formed, standardized, those that are often embraced by a government, by corporations, by authorities that give them prestige, that give them a sense of status and continuity, those are the languages we want our children to study. 
we want our students to be able to be fluent in. The other ones, the ones that are hybrid, that are broken, that are decomposing or in ruins, or at least in a process of, of, of being made, those are languages that we look out with certain suspicion. They don't have yet the status of having produced a Shakespeare, or a Goethe, or a Flaubert, or a Cervantes. A language that is worthy of its name is a language that has produced a masterpiece. A masterpiece that can be read by its speakers, its readers, and a language, a, a masterpiece that is also able to project the sensibility, the complexity of the time in which that work has been produced. And so there are languages that have status and languages that don't have status, but within the languages that have status, there are also differences. Uh, on campus, there is often the tension between German and French, considered to be European highbrow languages, whereas Spanish is considered a language to be not quite at the same level, because it is the language that often reminds people of what is happening with immigration. All this, all this uh, undocumented uh, individuals that are crossing the border and taking our jobs, they don't speak German, they don't speak French, they speak Spanish, and they don't really speak it, they, they butcher it. They don't really know how to use it, and as a result of that, why are we going to teach our kids to learn, to, to speak that language? We better teach them to speak the language of Humboldt or the language of Moliere. Not all languages are created equal. And because not all languages are created equal, those are, are, that are created unequal and are at the bottom of the, of the ladder are often the ones that are closely connected with a sense of lack of prestige, of the, la the lack of solidity. When I arrived to this country in 1985, I witnessed something dramatic. I had come from Mexico and my big dream was to learn the English language experientially. But fortunately or unfortunately, I arrived to New York City. And New York City is and isn't the place where the English language is spoken. It is the place where you could think that it's closest to the Tower of Babel. You enter to the subway and, and into a car and you hear all, all these immigrant languages. And at the same time, you hear all these English versions or varieties that are in the process of becoming. And my, on, upon first arriving, I was shocked, shocked by the types of words that I would hear on the subway, thinking, well, this is not quite Melville, this is not quite Hemingway or Fitzgerald. Maybe I should go only to the books and forget about what is happening on the street, forget certainly what is happening in the, on the subway. And yet there was an allure, a, 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 a magnetic element in, in, what, in what I heard, and particularly by those English language speakers that were actually trying to combine, or I thought it was a combination, between Spanish and English. Many of them Puerto Ricans, they call themselves New Yorkans, that is, Puerto Ricans from New York. Many of them had been Hibaros from the countryside that had arrived to the, to the city, but many others were already New York based, they had been born there, and they still spoke something that sounded like Spanish, but that I, as a Mexican, couldn't quite, rec couldn't quite recognize. And I was shocked, not only because I couldn't recognize the language of Hemingway and the language of, of uh, Fitzgerald on the subway, but because I could not longer recognize the language of Borges and of Cervantes and of Quevedo, of the writers that I most loved. And instead, what I had was a uh, what in Hebrew is referred to as a mishmash, a kind of chaotic a stew where things didn't quite have a, a, a belonging and where everything seemed to mix. And my first reaction with the shock was of, a, of disgust. This is not what I want to learn. This is not who I want to be as a speaker, and I'm going to reject it. And it was many years later, I was telling some of the students earlier today, when a student of mine made it conscious, made me conscious to the fact that even though I had rejected it, I was very much a fluent Spanglish speaker, and that it was time for me to pay much more attention to it, even in a scientific, conscious, deliberate way, studying it, analyzing how it is formed, in trying to make sense, putting it in context to understand where Spanglish has emerged 
from, where, where is it going, and what does it say? And what I've concluded is that Spanglish is a mestizo language. Mestizo is a beautiful word, a beautiful Mexican, Nahuatl word, that means almost neither here nor there, part European or part foreign, part native, part aboriginal. Mestizo is really the identity of the Mexican uh, country, the Mexican nation, the ideal way of seeing oneself in the country uh, in that it comes at the very beginning of the 19th century as an attempt to reject Europe, and Spain in particular, and say we are not Europeans, we're not Spaniards, to also say we're no longer Spaniard, uh, indigenous, we're not in indigenous, aboriginals, but we are something in between. It's just as in the colonial period in Latin America, there was an encounter, a racial encounter between those two, Spain and the Indian, uh, the many Indian tribes, the civilizations that were there prior 1492. I think that what we are experiencing today is a new form of mestizaje, and that mestizaje is really cultural and certainly linguistic. I think that uh, Spanglish is a beautiful form of cross-fertilization, of a, a encounter between two sides that don't need to reject one nor the other. But Spanglish is also an immigrant language. And in that, I want to give you a little different perspective. The United States, and I see myself, count myself, and I'm proud to say I am an immigrant, is a country of immigrants. But we use the word immigrant in a rather loose and as of late derogatory way. Immigrants are those that have arrived and are often uh, not paying our taxes and are ready to take the hospital beds and taking the, the places in the, class, in the classrooms and are doing something that we proud Americans are not doing uh, the way it should be done. Well, in other words for immigrants are settlers. The very first immigrants that came from Europe were those from the uh, Mayflower. You can call them settlers, but they were also coming from another place and, and arriving to a new land and trying to discover what that new land was going to be. As a, as a country of immigrants, we have a, 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 a glue that keeps us together. And that glue is the English language. We all are able to communicate in English, no matter where we come from. And the hope is that a child arriving from Chechnya, and a child arriving from South Africa, and a child arriving from El Salvador, all within a short period of time will give up their native immigrant languages and embrace the English language as a means for all of us to be together, as it should be, as it should be. The fact that we have English is really the point of encounter of all of us. But things are not really that easy. They are far more complex. And certainly when it comes to Latinos, that complexity is something that should be paid attention to. Think of this. When an Italian immigrant, or when a Jewish immigrant, or when a German immigrant, all in the 19th century, came to the United States from Europe, they had to travel many miles. They had to make a conscious decision to leave their families as, uh, back, to begin a new life, and to begin a new life in a new language. I'm going to take the case of the Jews. I know it better because it's closer to me. I'm part Jewish, part Mexican, or both parts coming together, and American. Um, for a, a Yiddish-speaking Jew in the 19th century, say in 1850, 1870, coming from a shtetl in Eastern Europe, say Poland, there were pogroms, there were anti-Semitic outbursts. That individual came to the United States often without their parents. When they arrived, they came with Yiddish. And Yiddish was the language of communication among them. Yiddish had not been the language of Poland. It was the language of Yiddish, of, of Jews, the, the Yiddish speakers of a particular region. Within a certain number of years, the immigrant is supposed to be learning the English language. If the immigrant is an adult, that, is ta that takes a little longer. When the immigrant is not an adult, that, is, that goes much faster. The hope is that by the time the child of an immigrant 
is 10, English is going to be the dominant language, but there's going to be a duality. English is going to be the language of the streets, of education, of the school. The Yiddish language, the immigrant language, is going to be the language of the home. And as such, the child is going to have to navigate between the two. At some point, when reaching adulthood, English is going to be the dominant language, and Yiddish is going to recede to be almost pushed aside, forgotten, and eventually really almost disappeared. The child of the child of the immigrant will probably not speak Yiddish, at least maybe recognize a few words, and maybe upon growing up will feel a certain, a certain nostalgia for that language that was lost, that language that his parents or his grandparents used often in order for the child not to understand something, in order to have something that was, that was private. That is the pattern that has happened with just about or almost every immigrant from the beginning of time when those immigrants into the United States have come with a different languages. But it is not happening with Latinos. It is not happening with Latinos and the sign is clear and loud. Latinos are not giving up the Spanish language. In families where the, there's an immigrant, Spanish continues to be the language of home and continues to be for the second generation and sometimes, though not always, for the third, for the third generation. There are more elements that complicate the situation here than compared to any other group, and that is why I think Spanglish is so interesting. First, for a Jew to go back in the 19th century or beginning of the 20th to the place once called home, if she or he wanted to do so, it would take a lot of money, many miles, and a lot of mental effort. The proximity of Latin America, the proximity of Puerto Rico, of Mexico, of Guatemala, of Cuba, is such that within 90 miles from uh, Florida, you can, be, you can actually see uh, Havana. Uh, from Hartford to San Juan, Puerto Rico, it is really less than an hour. And for anybody to travel from San Antonio to Mexico, it takes 10 minutes. Meaning that the, pla the past is never fully closed. The past is just next door on the other side. Number two, there is not really a first generation, second generation, or third generation Latino. We have been coming to this country from the very beginning. In fact, the country came to us rather than us to the country. The entire Southwest, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, California, Texas being exceptions, but within that constellation, were started in Spanish. And so for many Mexicans that cross the border, for many Central Americans, in some ways it's kind of a return home, or at least a, a, a coming to a place where the language at least was used at some, past, at, at some part in the future, in, the, in, the, in history. And then there's the fact that no sooner do Mexicans stop arriving from a particular town that uh, Central Americans, Guatemalans or, or Hondurans or, or, or uh, uh, Costa Ricans start coming and then from different parts of Latin America, meaning that Spanish is always being renewed in this country. There are today 55 million Latinos in the United States. 55 million Latinos in the United States is an astonishing number. There are more Latinos, as I was mentioning in one of the classes, there are more Latinos in the United States than Spaniards in Spain. There are more Latinos in the United States than Canadians in Canada. There are more Latinos in the United States than in any of the Latin American countries with the exception of one or two. The United States is the third largest concentration of Hispanic people in the entire world, except that in Mexico, there are Mexicans, in Colombia there are Colombians, in Argentina there are Argentinians, in the United States there are Latinos, meaning we come from Colombia, we come from Argentina, we come from Mexico. We are a sum of part, a pluribus unum. We are an addition rather than a, a subtraction. And as such, we come from very many different languages, many different Spanishes. The Spanish from Argentina is different from the Spanish of Colombia or from Mexico or from Central America. All this to tell you that just as Yiddish mostly gave in 
to the presence of English, and so did German, and so did Italian, and some words remain fossilized. Mafia, for instance, uh, pizza, um, schmendrick, chutzpah, uh, from the Yiddish. The Spanish language is alive and well in the United States, but in an impure, contaminated, if you want to call it prostituted, fashion. And that is because it is a language in contact with another. Um, there are two television networks in the United States, Univision and Telemundo, and the power they have to keep the language alive is astonishing. I, we can talk a little bit more about it in a second. They are instrumental in the dissemination of the Spanish language in this country. So does this mean that Latinos are not assimilating? Well, maybe. Or are they assimilating in a new pattern, following a certain paradigm that is different? Maybe. What is certain to me is that uh, the language of Latinos is undergoing a dramatic essentialist and mestizo uh, pattern that is in need of study, of analysis, and of discussion. We have a way of communicating called Spanglish that is neither Spanish nor English and that is used by many, many millions of people out there, not only in the United States, but in other parts of Latin America. And just as there are many different forms of, Spanglish, of Spanish in Latin America, there are different forms of Spanglish in the United States. Cubonics, Cuban-American Spanglish, Dominicanish, Dominican-American Spanglish, uh, Pachuco or Pocho or Tex-Mex or Mexican-American Spanglish, and there is New Yorican, and within those groups there are varieties that also distinguish the many different Spanglish speakers. I want to give you a very brief, uh, kind of one, two, three summary of how I see Spanglish, going beyond what I just said. Number one, Spanglish uses code switching. I assume many of you are aware of it. Empezar una frase in one language, cambiar to the other, back y de regreso constantly and you do it effortlessly, as, as one of the teachers said, really spontaneously, you can start in one, you can, you can start in the other, as long as the person that is understanding you understands you, then the process of communication has taken place. Now the question is, if the person that is, is understanding you speaks Spanish, why don't you just speak in Spanish? If the person that is before, bef in front of you speaks English, why don't you just speak English? Why this? coming and going, why this in and out, this mix? Well, because the languages are in contact and because we don't always think before we speak and because we are lazy and because we do the first thing that comes to our mind. And if you live in a block in New York City where the majority of people are doing this, if you don't do it, you're going to look weird. You're going to feel uncomfortable. There's a lot of peer pressure in using Spanglish. And that, that peer pressure defines the way you're going to feel a member of the group or are you going to be rejected of that group? Code switching. Number two, thinking in one language but communicating in another. Many of us do it all the time. You can actually say every single word in Spanish, but the Spanish that is going to come out of your mouth doesn't sound like Spanish sounds like English. It's, it's following the syntactical pattern of the other language, the dominant language that you have in your mind. And as a result, a Spanish, a Spanish speaker is going to say, wait, we don't say that. That's not the way it goes. The, the most common example is te llamo patras. I'll call you back. We don't say te llamo patras in, in Spanish. We say te devuelvo la llamada. Te regreso la llamada. Te llamo de regreso. Um, but te llamo patra sounds really, awfully, beautifully, like I'll call you back. Te llamo patra. <laughs> and there are many others that are similar. You're thinking in one language, communicating in another, and that is because you, you are right at the border, the border that you carry with your, within yourself, the border that is having the two languages and having the two cultures. And the third one is the coining of new terms. There are, in my dictionary, 
close to 6,000 terms that don't appear in the OED, in the Oxford English Dictionary, or in the uh, uh, Diccionario de la Real Academia Española, and they are terms that have been invented, if you please, coined by Spanish speakers, such as liquear, eh, friqueado, estresar, eh, la green card, so many of, the, of them I was talking about today. Eh, you could say la tarjeta de identidad or la tarjeta verde, nobody would say that, but la tarjeta verde. In Spanish you could say gotear, but liquear sounds better. Rufo, and not techo, marqueta, instead of mercado, eh, factoría, certain parts of Latin America actually use the word factoría, um, words that really come from the English and you're adapting them, and you know, it, it can make you cringe, it can make you uncomfortable, uh, but here is the democratic, pluralistic element. If one person uses friquear, that person is going to be seen as a loony. If two people use the word friquear, those two are going to sound like a club. Three, that might be cool. If it's an entire village, the word friquear is going to be a norm. And you know what? Dictionaries eventually will have to include the word friquear because no other word will be able to say exactly the same thing. Language, in the end, is of those that use it, those that abuse it, those that form it and deform it. And we intellectuals like to think, we teachers, we writers like to think that the language that we use is far better than the language that everybody else uses. But hey, this is a very democratic country and the word bad, I was talking about it today, no longer beats bad. The word bad actually means cool and good these days. And languages come in and out of fashion just as words come in and out of the language. I was thinking the other day with a student of mine of the term information superhighway. Nobody uses it anymore. I, th I remember hearing Al Gore using the term information superhighway to refer to the, to the web, to the, to the to internet. And to use information superhighway 15 years ago might have been really cutting edge. Today it sounds like a dinosaur. It's, it's talking, and that's because all these words are coming in and out of fashion, and because all these languages are emerging and, and, and are disappearing. I want to say uh, a couple of things here and I, uh, to wrap my talk, and then invite you to hopefully have a dialogue with me. As you can see, I'm a lover of Spanglish. I get a lot of bad vibes as a result of that. And I, I get a lot of love as well. Um, we often cry the disappearance of indigenous languages in Latin America, in Africa, uh, in other parts of the world that no longer have speakers and are in the process of being extinct. And we should cry and make every effort we have, we can, in order to make them endure. But we seldom celebrate the emergence of a new language because we feel threatened by it, and we feel that that language is going to replace something we already have, something that we cherish, that language is going to pose a new paradigm and unsettle us. Well, Spanglish is such a phenomenon. It seems to me that uh, it announces something altogether new. Uh, by calling it Spanglish, we are already defining something that was there. I had uh, an octogenarian the other day come to me and said, you know, of all the things that you've been doing, there's one thing that I really want to thank you for, and that is that you call it Spanglish. I might not like the name, but the fact that I know that it has a name means to me that it exists. When I was growing up in San Antonio, he said, we just spoke it, but we didn't know we spoke it, and we didn't have a name for it, so we didn't quite feel that it belonged to us. By naming it, it, it has been appropriated by us. The second thing I want to tell you is that um, I don't think that the key for Latinos to enter the future is to speak Spanglish alone. I think that every immigrant group needs to learn the English language fully in order to enter the society. On the other hand, I don't think that in the process of acquiring any language, you have to give up one of your own. And if that language is Spanglish, 
that's just as well. Keep it to yourself and do something with it. My students, I teach courses on Spanglish, I give lectures, my students tell me that the knowledge that they have of Spanglish these days is actually very useful to them to get jobs. Uh, to get jobs in advertising, in sports, in, with different corporations, it, in, with the federal government. George W. Bush, in his first presidential campaign, went to his nephew in Miami, a fluent and perfect Spanglish speaker, to communicate with a Cuban-American electorate that was younger than 25. Because he thought that that Cuban-American electorate, youngish, was only going to be targeted through that hybrid language. And he got that vote. Al Gore, Clinton, Kerry, Bush, Obama have invested more money in Univision and Telemundo than in all of the other television channels in the past three presidential, four presidential elections. And it is predicted that they will put more money in this election into those television networks than in any other. One of those television networks, Telemundo, did something really dramatic about two months ago. Really dramatic. Feeling that it was losing the competition against Univision, who is the strongest and much more visible television show, and being that telenovelas are the two forms that really attract the most audience, Telemundo announced publicly that all its telenovelas from now on being filmed were going to be not longer in Spanish, but in Spanglish. And they were going to have subtitles, closed captions, in either English or Spanish. Now, I think that that is a dramatic moment, a, a, what it used to be called a Kodak moment, a moment that freezes time and makes you think of it in a totally different way. The fact that through uh, Telemundo, we can now hear in our living room the very same language that we use in that living room, thus being legitimated or authenticated by those that are projecting it on the screen, means that something really substantial is happening. And finally, let me tell you that uh, I think that the difference between a language and a dialect is that the language, and this is not I who is saying it, but uh, Max Weinreich, a uh, wonderful 20th century linguist, is that the language has an army behind and the dialect does not. I don't know where Spanglish is going to go, um, but when I'm asked if Spanglish is going to have a presence in the future, if it's going to shape the English language, if it's going to redefine the Spanish language, my answer is always, you don't have to go to the future. The future is already here. Spanglish is already an incredibly useful way of communication. And those of us in the classroom or in writing who don't pay attention to it are really not paying attention to a very large portion of the population. And, I, and the last thing is that uh, I am known, or maybe I am famous or infamous for having translated um, not only now the first chapter of Don Quixote, but uh, uh, the entire book um, into Spanglish. And um, many students today have been asking me, what's the purpose of translating such a book into Spanglish? Uh, and uh, who reads it? And um, I want to conclude by telling you that it seems to me that uh, any bilingual speaker lives in translation lives in a constant state of coming and going between languages, either conscious or consciously or not. Our life is a process of being translated, identity, verbally, socially, uh, culturally. And that translation is a way to appropriate, to say, here we are, uh, this belongs to us. It could have been done with the Bible, it could, have, it could have been done with Shakespeare, it could have been done with Fitzgerald or with Hemingway or with Emily Dickinson, and they have been done by now, thank God. But for me, Don Quixote is the apex of, Mex of a Spanish culture, the centerpiece. It is to Spanish culture what Shakespeare is to English. And if we 55 million Latinos want to have a, a Cervantes of our own, why not have it in 
Spanglish. Um, some people have said to me, but that is your Spanglish. That is not the Spanglish of all the Latinos. It is still an unstandardized way of communication. And a New Yorican speaker or a Cubonics or a Dominican, Dominicanish speaker would have done it very differently. And the answer is yes. You know, there are 22 different English language translators and translations of Don Quixote into English. 22. Do we need 22 full-fledged translations? My answer is yes. We need 22. We actually need more. Each translation is an expression of the time in which it was written. There is a Victorian and Elizabethan and a modern and a postmodern translation into English of Don Quixote. And the more translations we have, the merrier, the more multifaceted and diverse we are. I, uh, I, I want to show you two documents. One is, uh, you probably have seen it, but I just want to read the first line of uh, Don Quixote in Spanglish. I was going to read the, the last, the first paragraph of the last chapter, which I have there, but so as not to get involved with the technology. Uh, and then I want to read a, post, a card, a greeting card. This is the uh, first part, chapter 1. In un placete de la mancha, of which nombre no quiero remembrarme, vivía not so long ago uno de esos gentlemen who always tienen una lanza in the rack, una buckler antigua, a skinny caballo, y un greyhound para el chase. And then I want to just show you something that Hallmark has done better than I have. Uh, this is a, a greeting card that I bought on a, do you have CVS here? Uh, you know, at CVS, um, it is for somebody who's sick. And it says in the back, Hallmark in Espanol, but it is really Hallmark in Spanglish. You'll see. Um, so it has a little tiger that has a thermometer and a water bag on his head. In the first image, in the second one, he's in his bed, uh, snuggling and with temperature. And you will see what else it says. What you, you'll imagine the other images. And it reads like this. Feeling sick, no te sientes bien, tienes que descansar, and then watch un poco de televisión, drink your tea con miel y limón, habla on the telephone, and before you know it, y de repente, you'll be feeling excelente. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a, a, a few minutes, uh, hopefully, for some comments, questions. The questions and comments that you've been asking me all day have been just extraordinary. Maybe you have more. Maybe you have less. You have one? Go ahead. The question is, because I can't hear well, so I'm going to repeat it. Uh, how did I choose what, what was going to be in one language, the code switching element? Um, I, I placed myself, I imagined myself in the middle of New York City, the way I would be speaking with another Spanglish speaker and try intuitively to think of the words that would come to me or that I would send out, but that I would choose either this way or that. For me, translation is about intuition, is about listening to the word in your ear and then translating it to the text. So it was improvisational, jazzy, spontaneous, but hopefully very attuned to how the language works on the street. Somebody else? Are you, yes.
Yo creo que... El, el, I'm switching to English. So that everybody, or most people understand. The question was, um, she speaks, she mixes Spanish and English, but her mother tells her that uh, she should stick to one, she should stick to Spanish, uh, in order to, to speak uh, uh, the right way. Um, and uh, I, you know, there's a, there's a lot of tension between generations when it comes to Spanglish. The older generation might say, only speak English, or only speak Spanglish, but don't do this chaotic thing that you're doing, mixing Spanish and English. Um, and I think, I, as a father, I can tell you, I can see the value of that. You want your kids to be able to enter society by having the tools. But as a father, I could also tell you, and I don't want to get mixed in family dynamics here, um, I could also tell you that there is always the rebel in youth. And make, they did it themselves when they were young, and their parents would tell them, this is not the way the English language or the Spanish language uh, should be used. If you keep something of that among your friends, if you turn it into poetry, if you turn it into a form of expression, insofar as it helps your needs with your group, that's perfectly fine. As long as you are able to understand also and become fluent in English, and in Spanish, the best you can do is be trilingual. Spanish, English, and Spanglish. Yes? Spanglish is a, the question is, is it only uh, among people that, uh, in families that where the parents spoke English, is that what you said? Or Spanish, uh, or is it in communities where the, where the mix is alive? Uh, you know, Spanglish, if you go to East LA or to La Villita in, uh, or Pilsen in, in Chicago, or to Little Havana in, um, in uh, Miami, you will hear a very different Spanglish than if you go to a family that is the only Hispanic family, the only Spanish or Spanglish-speaking family in an environment where, the, where everybody else is not from that background. If that family is going to try to protect their language in a way that doesn't need to be protected, or maybe it needs to be protected in a different way, when the majority of the people around are Spanish or Spanglish speakers, and the result of that is going to be very different. Um, there are people who did not uh, grow up speaking Spanglish, but then moved to a Spanglish-speaking neighborhood, most of the people there being Latinos, and acquired it depending on the age. There are others in my family, for instance. I speak Spanish to my children. I speak English to my wife. She speaks English to my kids. And among themselves, they speak Spanglish. Sometimes we speak Spanglish too. But I try to create in them the sense that there is a structure of the Spanish language that is important. And yet there's nothing bad in experimenting, in messing things up, as long as you know what you're messing up. Um, so Spanglish is it's, it's spoken by so many different people in so many different ways that uh, is incredibly rich. Yes? The two parameters that I, that I um, often like to think of when I study Spanglish, on the one hand is Yiddish, the one that I was mentioning before, the language spoken by Eastern European Jews from the 12th century until the Holocaust and today mostly by, by Orthodox Hasidic Jews, and Black English, or sometimes what is called Ebonics. Um, there are points of comparison between Spanglish and Ebonics, and many points, th th many of those points bring similarities, but many of them show differences. Similarities, many of the Spanglish speakers come from the hood, the ghetto, the, the, a particular geographical realm within the city. It is the language of youth. It is the language of rebellion. It's the language of music, of rap, of hip-hop. 
the language of graffiti, something that is very dear to the black English in the African American community. The difference between the two, and I'm really going, kind of brushing over very quickly, is that Spanglish is not spoken or used by youth alone and by one class in society. Spanglish has managed to bridge out and is spoken by middle class, upper class, by people from different backgrounds in the city and in the countryside in a way that a black English is not quite. So I would say that you could see elements of, of contrast and also an elements of divergence. And one thing that I can tell you that is very interesting is that as of late, there are a number of rap and hip hop groups that are African American that don't have a single Latino musician, player in it that are using Spanglish to, to get to a wider audience. It seems that Spanglish today, no matter what your background is, is the conduit to reach a more broader audience that is almost pan-ethnic or beyond ethnicity, which I find it very interesting, very interesting. And maybe one more, you had one, sure. Leave it to this school to, to have such good students and such good questions. One of my, my big questions is, when the Spaniards arrive to what is today Latin America, was there a point in which, in the process of acquiring Spanish by the indigenous, indigenous population, there was a mix with Nahuatl, with Tlaxcalan, with Mayan, that could be the equivalent of Spanglish today, that is a coming and going between the European language and the languages of the region. I'm only beginning my studies there, and I don't want to uh, generalize, but I am now uh, studying some uh, texts from the 18th century that are written by mestizo authors for an audience that is not the Spanish elite, that appear to use this interchange of words, um, and that eventually result in the type of Spanish that we have today. For instance, in Mexico, eh, amaca, aguacate, cacahuate, eh, platicar, words that, coming from different ground, backgrounds, define Mexican Spanish in contrast, in contrast with others, must have some direct root to that coming and going. On the other hand, you know, 40, uh, 55 million is a huge number. Um, media is substantial. I don't know if the level of sophistication of society at that time, um, the, the navigating between different, you know, from school to the street, to the restaurant, to the church, uh, enabled people to play with languages, but I am too early there. I promise that if you invite me back, uh, at some point in 10 years, I'll have an answer for you. I want to thank you very much. This is a wonderful school, and, and uh, you're terrific.